Hello, in this video I want to go over some of the stuff that you need to know when you're switching your welder over from a MIG process or even a flux core with gas shielding to a self-shielding process. This will be specifically things that you will do to your welder. This will have nothing to do with the actual settings or the manual welding process of that wire. I just have a few things that I've noticed, students and different people that I've met throughout the industry commonly mess up and I want to see if I can help you guys fix them. Some of the stuff we're going to talk about are going to be the rollers. We're going to talk about roller tension. We're going to talk about spool tension. And then finally, I want to talk about polarity. Now, if you notice I'm working on a big welder and if you maybe have a small welder, maybe it's like a 140 or something like that you bought at Home Depot or Harbor Freight, all of this information definitely applies to you. So stick around. Starting off with the rollers, there are two different styles of rollers. I mean, there might be some couple subcategories, but for the most part, there's only two real different styles. Over here in my right hand, I have a smooth style. Hopefully you guys can see that on camera. And in my left hand, I have a knurled style. Now the knurled style is the one you're going to be wanting to use for any flux core process. The smooth will be used for any MIG or any hard wire process no matter what the transfer process might be too. So if you're running a spray transfer or short circuit, it doesn't matter if it's a hard wire, you're going to want to have smooth rollers. The reason that you can use a smooth roller is because that hard wire can handle a lot more pressure and it won't deform or crush. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this one aside because we are talking about flux core. So like I said, you can with the hard wire, you can put more downward pressure on it, while with a flux core, you just can't do that. Because remember the inside of that flux or inside of that wire is full of flux. So it'll easily crush. And if it crushes, it will deform. So these knurls on the outside of this roller will actually do more of a grabbing technique. Now, if you crush or deform that wire, it won't wanna feed as well. So then you're gonna have a lot of problems with it jamming or just getting stuck in the liner. Or maybe it's getting stuck at the tip or maybe it's just balling up right there at the rollers. So having uh, the correct rollers in there and having the correct uh, roller tension is paramount. So let's talk more about that roller tension really quick and how to set that on most machines. Here's our roller carriage. Um, most roller carriages are pretty basic. Uh, this is the Lincoln Electric style. I, I've noticed that almost every Lincoln Electric has moved to this two roller style. Um, it's really nice. It seems to be indestructible. And honestly, we don't have a lot of problems with it if it's adjusted correctly and you're using the correct rollers and all that kind of stuff. How it works, this bottom roller down here is stationary and the top one will swing up if we move our tensioner out of the way. So this here is the tensioner. We're able to apply pressure and it's spring loaded so you're able to tw twist it down and then twist it out depending on how much tension you wanna have on here. If we were to remove this little cover, I guess it's not really a cover, there's actually a channel on both sides for that wire to go through. You can see that the, the actual rollers are moving in and out as I am pushing this thing in and out, okay? Like I said before, if you have too much uh, tension on that wire, it will crush and it will deform, and that's how you end up having those bird's nests inside of your rollers. So you wanna make sure you're uh, not over-tensioning it. If anything, I would be low tension until it's slipping and then kind of bump it up from there. So here on our nameplate, we can go ahead and we can figure out all of our wire tensioning that we need to know. They're gonna have all of our solid wire on one side and we got all of our cord wire on the other side. Notice that there is multiple styles here and it doesn't really matter because they're all pretty much the same. Um, you know, you got your outer shielding is gonna be more of your dual shield and what, what we're talking about today specifically is gonna be this inner shielding. Uh, there's hardly any difference at all. Now, notice that you have two lines coming off it from here to here. This is telling us that we're gonna be somewhere between a three and a four. That, that should be our max. Now, not all welders have it very easily uh, accessible to figure out what our setting should be, but ultimately what I would recommend you do is to back it off as much as possible, back off the tension that is, and until the wire is slipping, and then start tightening that tension up until you have, it grabs the wire and it's pulling it through nicely. That would be the way I would go about it if you do not have some sort of wire tensioning uh, placard. Otherwise, I would look at each placard individually. Now, the reason most people uh, over tension their wire is because they actually have too much spool tension on there. So let's talk about our spool tension now. So the spool tension is literally how easy 
It is to spin our spool. We don't want it to be super easy and we don't want it to be super hard. The reason we don't want it to be super easy is as you're pulling it off and all of a sudden you stop pulling wire off, the wire will get really loose and then it'll run on top of itself and then you'll actually have it bound up on itself. I don't know if that makes sense. The wire will be on top of the other wire and it just creates a massive problem. Same thing if you take off a roll of wire, you never want it to get loose. You always want to keep a nice tension on that wire so that way it never gets loose and then the wire gets on top of each other. Um, the reason you don't want it to be too tight is one, it's going to have problems with our, our rollers it can, and if we have to turn up our roller tension, you're going to have issues with having, a, I think it's called a roller overload warning. Um, we get this one all the time. If I see uh, usually it comes down to somebody has the tension too tight on their rollers or I mean on their spool tension So you gotta usually back this thing off Ultimately, it does not take a lot of tension We just don't want this thing to freely spin when we're moving the wire to and fro, right? So over right here you spin this little flat if you want to loosen it up You're gonna back it out and if you want to tighten it up, you're gonna turn it in righty tighty lefty loosey same exact thing See how multiple wires move there? That means there is not enough tension on my spool, but it doesn't take a heck of a lot to put enough tension on there. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna turn it in um, two or three times, and I'm gonna try this test again. Still a little bit of movement on some of those other wires, so I'm gonna go and twist it in a little bit more. And now see, it's not loosening those other wires up at all. Like I said, little bit goes a long way, so do not over tension your spool. Okay, so the last thing I wanna to talk to you about is polarity. And you might be wondering, why am I showing you a really nasty, ugly weld? Well, I'm running in the wrong polarity here. Um, this weld was actually ran in DC electrode positive, which is the common polarity if you're running any sort of MIG or um, even some flux cores, but usually they're gas flux core. They're not self-shielding. About 95% of all self-shielding wire needs to be ran in the DC negative or DC electrode negative. Now, like I said before, setting your polarities wrong is probably the most common thing that people do in self-shielding to mess up their weld. And I was trying to figure out why. And I think the reason is, is because people cannot figure out which one is the electrode and then which one is the work or which one should be which, okay? So I brought you here because this is where you're actually gonna tie into our polarity poles or our positive and then this one's our negative. Um, and I wanna to try to explain it. Now we have our roller carriage right here. Now the roller carriage is connected to our filler material which is connected to the actual gun, otherwise known as the electrode. I know in stick welding the electrode would be that stick. Well in wire feed, the wire is that electrode. So whatever you're hooking into the electrode will determine whether you're DC positive or DC negative. Remember, DC negative is also known as DC electrode negative or DC positive would be DC electrode positive. As I said before, all self-shielding needs to be DC electrode negative or about 95% of them. So if you notice, I have my negative right here. This is the symbol for negative. Hopefully you guys can kind of see it and I'm hooked right into my roller carriage. Now I've gone and turned this pole into my negative pole. So now I have my DC negative. And then the work clamp will be on my positive. And if I was gonna need to switch this back to a MIG, all I would do is unhook these two and then just swap them. So that's my list of four things that you should really pay attention to when you're switching over to self-shielding process. Um, honestly, those four things probably account for about 95% of the problems that my students have and other people I've worked with have had with self-shielding. So just go back through them all and uh, see if that can help you. And as always, thank you for watching and I hope you have a great day.